games are pervasive in society. We all play games. I could have asked you, as I sometimes do, who here thinks they're a gamer, and probably about, in this crowd, I don't know, 10% of you might have raised your hands. Um, but then if you thought more broadly about what games are, you would realize that we're all gamers. We all have the experience of interacting, playing, being involved in some kind of game-like experience. When I say games, you probably think about some of the things like uh, what I just showed you. You probably don't think about work. You probably don't think about school. And you probably don't think about your business interactions as a consumer in the marketplace. But maybe you should. And that's the core point of what I'd like to talk to you about. Maybe we should start to think about how these experiences are inherently game-like, how they can be made more game-like, and how systems can be designed effectively that take advantage of the potential of games to drive real business value and other kinds of objectives. So maybe there's some opportunity here. I put up a little cartoon um, where two people are talking, and one says, we find our younger employees respond better to feature high score, then we need to increase profits. Uh, there's a grain of real deep truth to that. Why is that? Why is it that one sounds like a lot more fun to people than the other one when in fact they're exactly the same thing? And the reason is that games motivate people. No one forces you to play a game. You have to choose to play the game. And what we're seeing in recent years, especially with the rise of video games, are extraordinary numbers of people choosing to play these games. So Angry Birds, has been downloaded over one billion times. There's only, what, seven, eight billion people on the planet, only about half of those have ever had a phone or a computer. A billion times this simple little game about using a slingshot to uh, knock over a tower that some pigs are on uh, has been downloaded a billion times. Uh, Xbox Live, one of the um, uh, game console platforms, uh, from Microsoft, uh, says that users are on Xbox Live, the online version of their system, two billion hours a month. Just one platform, predominantly in the US, there are platforms uh, elsewhere in the world that are very popular as well, two billion hours a month. And lest you think that this is just something that people do in their spare time for fun, it's just something that kids do and so forth, um, first of all, I'll tell you that the Entertainment Software Alliance, the Trade Association for the, video, for the video game industry, says the average age of a video game player is, I don't know, anyone have a guess? 30. 37% uh, female. So this is fairly pervasive. It's very concentrated among younger people. So um, the Pew Foundation did a study, and they found that in the United States of kids 12 to 17 years old, 97% play some form of video game. Almost universal. Uh, but it's pervasive beyond that as well. Um, and this idea of playing games is not just something that people do in their spare time. Um, anyone have a guess what the most successful video game of all time is? Tetris? Tetris? No. Pong? Pong? No. Solitaire. Who would want to play Solitaire? All right, so either, either you had a really good guess or you're cheating. But yeah, Windows Solitaire. <laughs> Latest data we have, you win a prize. Congratulations. Um, Latest data we have from 2003, 9 billion hours people spent playing Windows Solitaire. One of the, one of the worst games um, ever designed. There it is right there. Um, and where do people play Windows Solitaire? They play it at work. They play it at the office. So this is not just something that is about teenage kids doing it in their living rooms. There's something powerful about games and about video games in, in, in particular that attracts people in a way. There's something about games that is deeply tied to motivation. The games have been designed effectively to motivate people to play them. And that is why games and gamification are potentially such a valuable area for business because motivation is such a central thing to all kinds of business interactions. Um, and the statistics suggest that most people are not that motivated. 70% uh, according to a number of studies of people say that they're not fully motivated at work. 
And uh, I don't have comparable data, but you think about it, people's motivation level in places like school. Now, I'm sure all of you were tremendously motivated every moment that you were at the Wharton School. Um, but at other schools, apparently, people are not always motivated <laughs> in class. Um, and um, certainly, when people are uh, going and shopping or engaged in other kinds of consumer and marketing interactions, they're not necessarily fully motivated and engaged in what they're doing. So who's motivated and engaged in what they're doing? Well, it's people playing games. Um, these are some photos uh, that were actually taken of people engaged in playing video games. And of course, this is not what everyone looks like all the time, um, but we see this real intense bond that's going on with this activity. The question is, what can we learn from this that's useful in a real world business context? Turns out it's not quite as hard as you might think. Because if you look at lots of activities in the real world, through the lands of games, they start to look very familiar. So um, what is the uh, monthly sales competition where you get prizes based on how much you uh, sell, other than what in games we would call a challenge? In uh, United's Frequent Flyer program, when you go from being a premier to a premier executive to uh, 1K or whatever the next level is above that, um, that's a leveling system. Uh, we know that, uh, and people in the games industry know how those systems work. They design them every day in these video games. Same sorts of things get used in uh, other kinds of real world business contexts. We see teams, we see scores, we see quests, we see reward mechanics, um, even things like badges. So the American Express Platinum card, um, or the black card, or whatever you get above that, um, is partly something that gives you some benefits. Uh, but it's also something that you can whip out to impress your friends about your status level. Um, that's a badge. And all of these structures are ones that are well established in the games world, and they're there in the real world as well. But we just haven't traditionally thought about them that way. We haven't looked at these activities through the lens of a game designer. So it turns out, actually, things like the frequent flyer programs, even though they have all of the elements of games. They've got points, they've got levels, um, they've got rewards, and so on and so forth. Most of them are terrible games uh, because they haven't been designed as games. Um, people do them to get the rewards, they do them to get the benefits, but they're not designed to be fun. And what we're starting to find in the work that I and others are doing is that if you learn from and bring in people who have expertise in game design, in making things fun, it leads to real benefits and real increase in the engagement level um, and the business metrics. So I got started a few years ago looking at this question of what is there about games that is powerful and motivating, and what can we take from video games and apply to the business world? This was a talk that I gave a couple of years ago. Uh, the Wharton MBA students organized something called Iron Prof, where they had a bunch of us get up and talk about our research. Um, and um, this was my presentation about my experience playing a game called World of Warcraft um, and how it was relevant to a whole range of different business areas. So what I'd like to talk to you about tonight is uh, the work that I've been doing and teaching about um, as it's evolved in learning from games. And the question is, what is it specifically that we can take from games and apply to other things, predominantly uh, to business context, but also to social impact, also to improving people's lives. What is it we can learn? And it turns out a great deal. So let me give you one concrete example, um, and then I'll tell you in general about what I mean by gamification, which is the word that we use to describe these kinds of phenomena, and then I'll give you some more in-depth examples. So the example comes from LinkedIn, the business social networking site, very successful, uh, recently went public, um, and you think about, well, what's, what's gamified about LinkedIn? Um, so here's my profile page on the LinkedIn site. And the part I want you to focus on is this thing in the top right corner, um, which um, is uh, a, a bar about how much of the profile I've filled out. So LinkedIn wants people to put lots of details on their profile. Gives them more data. Uh, that they can use to analyze and target more effectively, and puts more information out there for other people in the system. It's LinkedIn's a social networking site. So they want other people to be able to find you. If I'm looking for a business partner or an employee, the more information that's in there in someone's profile, the more effective that system is going to be. So LinkedIn really wants you to fill out your profile in as much detail as possible. But 
filling out your profile is not terribly fun inherently as an activity. So what they found was people were not filling out the whole profile. They put in their name and their email and just the bare minimum stuff and would go on and uh, not do more than that. Um, and then what they did was one day they put this progress bar into the profile page. A little, little blue bar you can see there, which just shows you of all the things you could fill out in your profile, how far along are you? What percentage of the profile information have you filled out? Um, and it says you're 90% of the way there in my case, and they've added on a few things that you see there about other things you could do. Um, according to Reid Hoffman, who is the CEO of LinkedIn, or the founder of LinkedIn, it took about an hour for a programmer to write this. Very, very simple kind of thing. Um, they didn't think it would make any difference at all, but they threw it in there. Uh, the moment that they put the profile bar in there, the average length of profile information people filled out on LinkedIn went up by 20%. Real direct lift as a result of this. And you think, why in the world? It's just a, a little gr blue bar. How does that actually motivate people? Um, well, it turns out that our brains are psychologically hardwired to love games, to love challenges, to love accomplishment and to love feedback. We want to know how far along we are. And just saying, well, here's a profile, go fill it out, doesn't inherently excite us. Adding that little element of saying, here's how far along you are, and oh, by the way, just a little bit more to get all the way complete, um, that is something that people tend to respond to. Um, and providing the feedback, breaking it down into small chunks, providing information about what you can do, that alone makes this experience not into a game, I'm by no means saying that LinkedIn is now a video game or that people report that they just love filling out their profiles on LinkedIn. It's taking something and making it slightly more game-like. Again, taking the lessons out of game design and applying it to deliver real business results. So this is a concrete example of what I'm talking about here. It's not building games. It's building game-like elements into existing processes and activities and the term for that is gamification. Now, I know it's an ugly, clumsy word. Um, I didn't make it up. It's got lots of problems. It's the word that has taken hold for this phenomenon. Some people talk about gameful thinking. There's other ways to describe it. Um, but it's all about taking real-world experiences, real-world business processes, and making them more game-like. And as I said, this is something that just really came on the scene as a, a well-articulated phenomenon in the last two to three years or so, um, and has had really explosive growth since then. Here's a few articles from various business magazines, uh, the uh, obligatory data from a market research firm, um, which I have no idea how they came up with these numbers. Um, but clearly, there's something going on, um, at least that that will tell you that companies are willing to pay money for a research report telling them that this is a big phenomenon. Um, there's a tremendous amount of interest. Um, and as I started to get into this field, I started to come across examples like the LinkedIn example and started to dig further. And it turns out there's a vast number of companies that are applying these techniques, ranging from small startups to very large, very well-established companies like Microsoft and Nike and SAP and Siemens and so on and so forth. In many cases, these companies didn't realize that they were gamifying. Some of these examples go back several years. Things like the LinkedIn example was not because someone came and told them as a consultant, you need to gamify. They just hit upon this and realized what they had. Some of these have been around for a while. Many of them, though, in the last year or two have come about because companies are starting to recognize the power of these techniques and apply them. So let me tell you in a little bit more detail about what gamification is um, and then dive into some more examples. Gamification I define as the use of game elements and game design techniques in non-game context. So again, it's not anything that involves a game in business. It's not saying, guess what, you no longer work at my company, you are now fighting dragons. No, you still work at the company. Um, but it's using these game structures, what we call game elements, and design techniques to make the experience somehow feel more engaging and to drive real business results. So there are three parts to that definition, game elements, game design, and non-game context. The first one is game elements. Game elements are pieces of games, components, uh, structures that come together to make up a game. If you think about a game, it's a, a total experience, and there's some parts of the game that you really can't 
reduce down to the components, but there's some that you can't. And so, again, as I said, the fact that there's a game doesn't mean that you're applying game elements. So I put up here the example, the Monopoly scratch-off game they have every year at McDonald's, very successful marketing promotion they've run for years, uh, uses a game to sell hamburgers and fries, not gamification. Because it's not about changing the experience of buying things at McDonald's. It's about you walk into the McDonald's and you potentially get a prize when you're there by playing a game that happens to be there at McDonald's. Um, so game elements are about using the more atomic structures of games, the components that go together to make up games and putting them together in different ways. And the important thing here is if you're using the elements as opposed to the entire games, you can integrate the elements in. You can take the elements and put them directly into an existing business process, like the LinkedIn uh, profile page, as opposed to saying, stop doing what you're doing and play this game experience. So what exactly do I mean by elements? Let me give you an example. This is a screen from a game. This happens to be one called Empires and Allies, one of the casual social games on Facebook from Zynga, a fine company started by a Wharton alum, Mark Pincus, um, which uh, has been uh, a rocket ship of success, although they've run into some issues recently. Um, but Zynga um, hit a billion dollars in sales in year three after founding. Um, so anyway, this is one of the games called Empires and Allies that Zynga makes. And you can look at this and say, all right, we see the aesthetics of the game. We see the graphics and what it's like to experience the game. But you can also look at this screen through the lens of the game elements. The elements, again, are the piece parts that go into this game. And the important thing is these are piece parts that can go into other games or into other things that are not games. So if you break down this screen and look at the elements, um, you see things like points pretty common thing in lots of games, especially video games. Um, things like quests, where they send you off to take certain activities. The avatars, which are a visual representation of the user. Uh, levels, uh, the idea of progression, that you move forward. That's what we saw in the LinkedIn progress bar. Um, all different kinds of techniques that are in this game and are in other games as well. And the powerful thing about breaking down games into these elements, as I've said, is that the elements can be applied to things that are not games. So here's an example of a site called Kias, K-E-A-S, was started by a guy named Adam Bosworth, was a senior executive at Microsoft and Google and BEA Systems, a number of uh, software companies. And um, Adam decided for his next thing he wanted to do something around health. Um, partly because he needed to improve his own health, partly because he had made a lot of money in the industry, wanted to do something that had some social benefit. So he decided to do something about health. And his first thought was, well, putting on his kind of geek worldview, the issue with health is people just need data. They need to see information about their health and see how exercising will help them, and they'll respond. Didn't work. You could show people lots of data and says, look, you're on your way to a heart attack if you don't exercise more and eat less. And people just said, well, yeah, I kind of know that, but the hamburger looks really good and it's kind of a pain to exercise. Um, so they went back to the drawing board and said, well, what if instead uh, we go into companies? Kia uh, serves enterprises. They partner with health insurers and enterprises to help improve health and well wellness for their employees. So they said, let's go in there. Instead of just giving them all the data, we'll put them into teams and we'll have the teams compete both to educate themselves as well as to engage in wellness activities and give them points for it, keep track of that on the leaderboard, give them badges and so forth. Um, huge uptake. Um, all of a sudden, making this more game-like made uh, the service much more successful. And when you look at this key screen, what you see is all the same kinds of elements that we saw before. So we've got the same progression, we've got the same levels, we've got the same points. In fact, if you remember the Zynga screen, they basically ripped off even the user interface of the Zynga screen up here uh, in this. We've got the quests and so forth. And this is not a game. Again, this is a service that is marketed to employees at Fortune 500 enterprises to help them become healthier. Applying the elements, deconstructing games, and putting them into these business contexts is what drives the real value in the activity. Second part of the definition is game design techniques, thinking like a game designer. Looking at problems through the lens of game design, and it's called game design because it's a species of design. 
Some of you may be familiar with a whole movement around design thinking um, that's been very popular in a number of business schools and other places, thinking about business problems like a designer. This in some ways is a species of it, but a game designer, someone who designs video games or other designs has a particular attitude towards what they're designing. Their goal is to get people to play, to get you to start playing and to get you to keep playing. Um, and to design the rules of the game in ways that encourage that kind of engagement. Because it's very different to think like a game designer versus thinking like a game player. As a player, you're experiencing the game, you're not making the rules. As a game designer, you're designing the system to engage people, to make them feel like the activity is fun. But it's not that easy necessarily to make something fun. If it was, then every game would be successful. We'd all be smiling and having fun all the time. It turns out to be really hard. And so game designers have developed a whole series of techniques. This is a guy named Jesse Schell, who's a noted game designer, who wrote one of the, the best known books in the field. It's a whole design, a set of techniques, things like iterative design, play testing, balancing, and so forth, that game designers use to make their games effective, to see how people respond to them, and to make them more fun. So gamification is about applying this in these business realms. And the final piece is applying it in non-game context. If you're making something fun because you want to sell games, that's a game, that's great, but that's not gamification. Gamification applies to any context outside of the game itself, including external, marketing, sales, customer engagement, internal, encouraging employees to work more efficiently, various kinds of HR processes and so forth, or behavior change, things like KIAS, encouraging people, getting people over the hump, as it were, to take activities, to change their life in a way that they want to but they have a hard time getting motivated to do in a sustained way otherwise. So that's what gamification means. Let me give you a few more concrete examples. Uh, this is something called Club Psych. Psych is a television show on the USA Network on cable, actually one of their more successful shows. And uh, they had a website, like every television show, um, and they wanted to get people to go to the website, to spend time there, to tell their friends about stuff. Um, and they turned to gamification as a way to raise the engagement level from a marketing standpoint on their website. And so they put in all the same kinds of game elements that we've seen already, um, things like the opportunity to earn points, to go on quests if you watch videos about the show or answer questions or do other sorts of things to unlock badges that you get in your profile. They had all sorts of tie-ins with the game. Um, and what they found was once they implemented this system, the views and activity on the site shot through the roof. The uh, transactions, uh, sales of merchandise through the site went up as well. Um, and the social interaction, the willingness of people to go and share on Facebook things about the site increased as well. Psych has about 4.5 million um, weekly viewers um, and they got 300,000 shares on Facebook, reaching 40 million people just out of this gamified site. And they even got nominated for an Emmy for one of the games that was embedded in it. So this is a classic marketing case, and we see dozens and dozens of examples now of companies using these kinds of structures. Um, this is a site that uses what we call PBLs, points, badges, leaderboards, um, to motivate people to engage on a site and um, to uh, be part of an activity. Uh, all right, so that one should be uh, at least fairly comprehensible. Let me give some other ones, though, that may be a little bit more surprising. Um, so, what could be more fun than reading over dialog boxes in Microsoft Windows to test for uh, localization? Um, the correct answer is a lot of things are more fun than that. Um, but if you're Microsoft, um, you sell Windows in hundreds of countries, and it matters a lot if the Hindi and Tagalog dialog boxes have errors. The people in those markets are not going to respond well if there are language errors in the localization. And even Microsoft can't pay enough people in every country in the world speaking those languages to go and review the dialogue boxes. So what they did, the test group at Microsoft, was created a game-like structure, a competition among Microsoft sales offices, to go out and review the dialogue boxes in Windows 7. You see the interface here to see is there something wrong in your language? Is there something wrong in this dialog box? And what they found was employees jumped at it. They said, all right, we want to win. We want to be at the top of the leaderboard. Our country, our office, in our spare time, we we're going to go and check these dialog boxes. Half a million dialog boxes. They didn't pay anyone for this. And there was no tangible reward at all. Um, they just encouraged employees to do it as a matter of good corporate citizenship. 
they reviewed half a million dialog boxes, found almost 7,000 bugs in Windows 7 through this gamified system. Next example. Um, you might think that servers, waiters and waitresses at restaurants would be the least uh, amenable to gamification. Um, this is a screenshot from a company called Objective Logistics, also founded by a Wharton graduate. Um, and they gamify the shift scheduling process for restaurants. Because what they realize is if you are a server at a restaurant, your take home pay is often dependent on tips. And so you want to sell more stuff, you want cons uh, the, the diners at the restaurant to give you a bigger tip, the restaurant wants that as well. If you're getting bigger tips, that means customers are happy and it means customers are spending more money. They're ordering uh, more expensive dishes. You want that too. But the problem is there's not a good feedback loop. The workers, the waiters and waitresses don't necessarily know who's doing well and what opportunities they have. So what Objective Logistics does is gamifies the process, provides a site that gives feedback to the servers about how they're doing um, and how they rank vis-a-vis -vis others um, and so forth. And the carrot it provides is this data goes to the restaurant owner who can use it in allocating shifts. Because if you're working as a server at a restaurant, you'd much rather be working Friday night when the place is packed than Tuesday at lunch. And so they create an incentive system for people to want to do better, get better tips um, by getting the opportunity to have the better shift scheduling. Um, and what they found with this system is they get about a 2 to 4% revenue increase for restaurants. Doesn't sound like much until you realize that the average profit margin of a restaurant in the United States is 3%. This goes directly to the bottom line. The restaurant doesn't have to spend anything more other than the uh, software uh, from Ejecta Logistics. Um, they get increase in their sales, which goes directly to the bottom line. And also, customers have a better experience, and the servers have a better experience as well, which reduces churn and has all sorts of other business benefits there. Last example. Speed limit enforcement. Uh, what could be gamified about that? Now, I mean, some of you may have tried to gamify the process when the officer pulls you over. May have had greater or less success. But um, the example I want to talk about is there's different ways that municipalities could do this practice of uh, encouraging people not to speed. The typical one is the cop with the radar gun. But a second one that a number of municipalities have tried is the little trolley that shows you how fast you're going. And all it does is says this is how fast you're going. There's no cop standing behind it. It doesn't uh, give you a ticket. It just says this is how fast you're going. And what has turned out, much to the surprise of a lot of these police departments, is that just giving people feedback, again, feedback is a core central element of games, just giving people feedback changes their behavior. Roughly 10% reduction in speed, uh, a number of studies have shown, when people uh, see these um, screens that tell them how fast they're going. But we can actually do better than that. Volkswagen had a contest called the Fun Theory to get people to come up with great ideas for making things more fun or gamifying them. The winner was um, this idea called the Speed Camera Lottery that was proposed by a guy who actually works at MTV. And here was his idea. Um, I don't know, we'll see if it's funny after I describe it. Um, here was his idea. Um, instead of just charging people, um, people are speeding, we catch them, we, we give them tickets. Let's take that money and put it in a pot. And then everyone who goes by the sign and doesn't speed, because there's a camera there and we can take a picture of your license plate, everyone who doesn't speed is entered in a lottery to win some of the money that has been collected from people who are speeding. So it creates a positive incentive. It's not just punishment, it's a game. If you don't speed, you might actually get some money out. Now, you're not guaranteed anything. Yeah, it's just a lottery, but that feels fun and game-like. Um, and so Volkswagen loved this idea. It won the contest. They actually deployed it on a trial basis in Stockholm, and they found, lo and behold, 22% reduction in speed going by that sign just by making it a little bit fun and game-like in this way. So we're seeing all these examples in different contexts, including many that, that seem surprising where gamification delivers real benefits. Um, and even, it turns out, um, there was an article about a year and a half ago in Foreign Policy Magazine um, where they looked at uh, Al-Qaeda terrorist training websites. Um, because um, these terrorist groups 
they want to motivate people too. They want to find the true believers who want to be martyrs and suicide bombers. So this is terrible. This is not, I'm not saying this is a joke. In a very serious way, though, they've got the same challenge that a lot of serious businesses have. They want to find their evangelists. They want to find the people who are really, truly committed and motivate them to become more committed. And it turns out, what have they done to accomplish this? Um, well, what they found when they looked at all of these terrorist websites is they gamified them. They created point systems, leveling systems, achievement systems that encourage and reward the most active contributors, the most committed contributors um, through these same kinds of mechanisms. So, of course, part of the lesson from this is this is a technique that can be used for good or for ill. This is something that can be used badly to manipulate people or for objectives that we would say are horrible, uh, but it's something that in all these contexts is being recognized as a powerful form of motivation. Uh, all right, so the question then that hopefully this gets you to ask is, well, how does this work? I mean, what is it about games that people find so engaging? What is it that actually motivates people? Um, so in order to do that, we're going to play a game. Um, don't worry, it's a very short game that won't depend very much of you. Um, here's the game. I'd like you to reach into your pocket or purse or wallet and pull out the oldest coin you can find. The game here is to see if we can find who's got the oldest coin in the room. Raise your hand if you think you, think you might, might have the oldest coin. Okay, what, how old is your coin? Yes. What? 1968? Anyone can, beat, can anyone beat 68? That's not that good. You guys are Wharton alums. I thought you'd be better at this. Four, oh, 42. Over here. What? You think it's 42. All right. Um, all right. Well, so I'll say that, I'll say that you're the winner. Um, all right. So why did I make you go through the trouble of this exercise? Um, it's to get us to think about the question I asked before. What is it about games that's motivating? What's the difference between a good game and a bad game? Um, who here thinks this was a good game that we just played? Oh, come on. It was a terrible game. <laughs> Ter you want to you spend your time doing that? I mean, it was an even worse game because I didn't realize how dark it was in the room, but come on. Uh, I mean, I, I'm 100% certain when I get off the stage and walk out, none of you will be sitting there still trying to play this game. This is not a very fun game. Come down to the bar, well, sure, okay. Um, so the question is, why not? What was wrong with this game? No reward. No reward. So um, who, who, said, who said that? Said, yes, you said no reward. So, um, so do you think if I um, said uh, whoever has the oldest coin gets this lovely laser pointer here, the game would have been more fun? It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the school, so I can do this. But um, all right, yes. Say a little more. Okay. What'd you say? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so the comment was, and this is this is a very good point. Um, there's no skill involved, right? That you, you, your your task is fish through your wallet. Um, but before I even start the game, there's a winner. There is objectively an oldest coin in this room, and you don't have any influence on which one it is. You just happen to pull it out. I said you're the winner because you happen to pull it out. Um, there's no challenge involved there. Anything else that uh, was bad about this game? Yes. Mm -hmm. So not much replayability. So um, we did it. Um, you thought it was a little bit fun, or at least you were willing to do it. Um, if I said, okay, now let's do it again, you would all kind of grumble and you'd be at the bar in 30 seconds, right? So it's a game that if it works, it works once. Um, and when we're thinking about engagement and motivation, we want things that are enduring and keep people playing. Anything else? Any other ideas how the game can be made better? Yes. All right, not everyone can play. Um, and um, not just that, but um, there's only one winner. Now, partly it's a winner that didn't really do anything other than happening to have a coin in his or her uh, bag that was older. Um, but I asked you all to play, and most of you, if you could see uh, the coin, if it was light enough, probably looked in your wallet and, and said, all right, the oldest one I got is like 1997. That's not going to win. You check out. Right? This is again, you're, you're technically playing the game, but for, as far as you're concerned, I'm just going blah, 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 because you know you didn't win. Um, and that's not terribly motivating to a whole swath of you. Okay? Any other thoughts about why this is a bad game? Yes? 
Okay, so the comment is it's like the lottery, it's a pure game of chance, but in the way I set it up it, to the point before, there was no reward. Um, so you think about it, lots of people play lotteries, lots of people play slot machines, even though there's no skill involved. Even though you see these statistics, like you are far more likely to be struck by lightning walking out of this building than you are to ever win the lottery, and yet people still play. Um, and so think about what is it that's engaging, what's motivating people there even though there's no skill and the reward is, is really theoretical for just about everyone. Okay, any other thoughts about this? These are all good points. Um, so the flip side of this is all of the things that this game I just gave you was lacking. The lack of skill, the lack of challenge, um, the lack of interactivity. Um, it's not something that you play with other people. It's competitive, but there's no collaboration involved. Um, it's really not social in any way. Um, and um, the lack of any particular reason to do it. Um, those are all limitations of this game, and they are the flip side of things that can be done to make games more engaging. So what we learn, again, from the field of game design is that designing systems that have challenges, designing systems that have progression, you start at the bottom, and the game is engaging and inviting and gets you playing, and then becomes a little harder, and a little harder, and a little harder. Um, and games that are social, games that involve collaboration. Remember the Kias example, the health and wellness example, was competitive. You were trying to compete uh, to be the best team, but also collaborative. You were working together with people in your uh, company, um, and we love socializing and interacting with people at the same time as we love competition. So these are all different kinds of motivational structures that can be designed into one of these gamified systems to make them more effective than the game I just gave you. Um, and it turns out that this ties into some very substantial research in psychology about what motivates people. The major uh, body of literature in psychology today about motivation is something called self-determination theory. And what it says is, actually contrary to um, the discussion that we just had, rewards don't necessarily motivate people. They do to a point. Uh, they do if the reward is big enough or certain enough. But the reward is limited in its motivational value. Uh, people, if they don't think they're going to get the reward, they check out. Um, and what tends to happen is if you use the reward to motivate, people get fixated on the reward. And if it's a task that's interesting, or at least could be interesting, a task like doing some project at work, um, or a task like engaging with something that a company is providing, if you focus on the reward and emphasize that, people forget about the interestingness of the task. They actually become demotivated. They say, you know what? All right, this is now an exchange. I'm doing this because you're going to give me some big thing that I want, um, and I'm only going to participate as long as you give me the reward. So the company or the provider that's building the system has to keep providing more and more and more rewards because if they stop or if the rewards don't uh, keep growing and becoming and uh, staying interesting to people, then people say, you know what, I was just in this for the reward to begin with. Even when it was a task that going in before the reward was there, people found interesting and engaging. So rewards have some value, but the value tends to dissipate what endures is what's called intrinsic motivation. Doing a thing because it's valuable, fun, engaging, worthwhile in and of itself. Lots of things that we do. Our interactions with our families, um, our, in our interactions with our friends, and even interactions that we have in the workplace, we do not because someone is saying, all right, I will pay you this amount of money, or I will give you this tangible thing. We do it because we want to because we find it fun. One big area of things that people do with no hope of reward is playing video games. All those billion numbers that I gave you before come about because people find games engaging and intrinsically motivating. So self-determination theory says, what does it take to be intrinsically motivating? Three things, competence, autonomy, and relatedness. Competence is a sense of accomplishment, a sense of mastery, progressing, overcoming challenges. Autonomy is choice, you're in control of the situation and you have options, and relatedness is you're part of something bigger than yourself. Either there's some social interactivity involved or there's some meaning or purpose in the activity. And it turns out that all of them are very heavily present in games. Games give you challenges. Again, that was what was lacking in the coin game I just gave you. No sense of challenge to be overcome. 
um, games involve autonomy. Again, in the coin game, you really didn't have any choice. You just pulled out the coin, whichever coin you had. A good game, though, gives you options and says, all right, the outcome is based on you. You succeed or fail based on how good you are and what you do, and people find that empowering. And finally, relatedness. A great many games, especially online and digital games, have a social component, um, and many of these gamified examples have some component of doing something for some higher purpose, either helping out your company, like the Microsoft dialog box case, or doing something that's good for you or good for the world. Um, so it turns out that well-designed gamified systems employ all of these elements that we see as core aspects of motivation in other contexts. And another way of putting that is that what this is talking about, this idea of intrinsic motivation, is what in the games world we call fun. What's fun? It's a word we use all the time. People are very happy to say, well, that was fun, that wasn't fun. We don't tend to analyze what we mean. What exactly makes something fun? It turns out that the practice of game design is about designing things to be fun. And as I said at the outset, not that easy. This is a very popular social game called Plants vs. Zombies, big hit video game. Um, and it's very simple in conception, but turns out to be wonderfully addicting to a whole lot of people. I, uh, as Dean Robertson said, I'm teaching this online class on Coursera, and as an exercise, I asked people to go and play the first level of Plants vs. Zombies. It's free on the web, and a whole bunch of people emailing me and saying, um, great, um, I just spent the last three hours playing Plants vs. Zombies because I couldn't stop and didn't have any time to finish your course or to finish my work today. <laughs> Sorry. Um, really fun game didn't happen serendipitously, didn't happen just out of the blue. It happened because the game designers spent months and months designing, testing, optimizing every aspect of this game to make it more fun. And that's the exercise of engaging in game design thinking, which can be applied to all of these other business and social contexts I've given you. So I don't have time to go into this in much more detail, but um, in the work that I've done, we've developed a six-step process to go through this design exercise, starting with identifying what the objectives are, because these gamified systems have to be built to serve some business purpose. Is it to get people to convert more on your website? Is it to get your employees um, to have some additional skills or to um, be more efficient in the workplace? What's the business objective? And then you go through and try and understand what you want people to do, who are the players, what's the uh, structure that they interact with the games through, and how do you make this fun? And um, this is a framework that, again, I talk about in the Coursera class um, and also in the book that I have coming out with my colleague Dan Hunter uh, next month from Wharton Digital Press, um, which I hope you will all run out and buy after this. Um, they should have some flyers outside, but uh, we talk about the way that this design process can be implemented in different contexts. So um, as I've gotten into this field, um, what I've come to realize is that it ties together a variety of things that we see already in other business contexts. So pretty much every department at Wharton ties into this concept of gamification. Uh, it's partly about some of these creative aspects like design, but it's also related to marketing and management, operations. There's even some legal and ethical dimensions to it as well. They all tie together around this idea of motivation, around using these insights from game design to encourage people to do things and to find them more fun and engaging. So that's the work that I've been doing. Um, we organized the first ever gamification workshop about a year and a half ago here at Wharton, teaching uh, the first uh, class that was ever offered starting last year for the MBAs, um, and also doing the online course, which as the dean said, um, now has close to 80,000 people signed up uh, to take this course. Um, and what we're finding is there's resonance in these ideas in all sorts of areas. Again, the concept is new. Gamification was not even a word three or four years ago, but it ties into these very well-established and well-researched principles in lots of different areas. So one more story, and then I will stop and take your questions. And it's a very, very famous um, old apocryphal story, um, which uh, to me is actually a game story. And the story goes something like this. The inventor of the game of chess um, presented the game to the emperor, whenever this was, wherever this was, and the emperor was overjoyed. Wow, this is an extraordinary invention. What a wonderful game. 
And so the emperor said to the inventor, name your reward. I'll give you anything you want. And so the inventor said, well, your highness, thank you so much. I want a very small thing, tiny thing. I want one grain of rice. One grain of rice, put the grain of rice on the corner, the first square of the chessboard, and then on the next square next to it, put two grains of rice, and then four grains of rice, just double it each time. And then when you get to the end of the board, I just want the rice on the board. And the emperor said, well, that's all you want, just want a few grains of rice, that's nothing. Sure, yes, you can have it. Uh, anyone have any idea how many grains of rice are on the board at the end? Any guesses? Three trillion? It's a big number. You think there are three trillion grains of rice on there? Um, you're, well, actually, you're not very close. 18.4 quintillion. Uh, the power of exponential uh, growth. You keep doubling and doubling across uh, all those squares. That's the total number in sum of grains of rice on the board. More rice than in the entire kingdom. All right, so what lesson do we take away from this? The rules matter. What do you, I'll give you my lesson. What, don't, don't play with that, play with that, that uh, inventor. Right, this was a very, a very wise person who invented chess. Yes, of course. Um, uh, the lesson that I take away from it is the rules matter. And the rules can be surprising. Again, when you're playing a game, you don't necessarily know what the rules are. You're just responding to them and interacting with the experience that's been created by the game designer. So the lesson that I take away and the message that I give to students in this area is be the designer. Be the one who makes the rules. Thanks very much. So we've got a few minutes left. Happy to take some questions. Yes, over here. And I, we have some mics, I think, or if not, I can uh, repeat the questions. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the use of this in loyalty programs and success, and especially actually in apparel retailers? Has there been any success? Most of what I've seen is that loyalty programs are, are pervasive in lots of industries. Um, but when you go and, and open them up, um, you, you tend to find that, that they're, they're not designed in a systematic way to be fun. Um, and what companies have found that design effective games, this is something Zynga um, has done extraordinarily well, is that it's a fusion of art and science. So part of the activity is get great creative people in um, and try and think about the fun of the experience. The other piece is get great analytics and data mining people in um, because what's wonderful about these systems is there's tremendous amounts of data. Every interaction that the user engages can be tracked and then you can do lots of A-B testing. What if we change this here? What will people do? Um, the impression that I have in general about the loyalty uh, marketing industry is that it's just starting to grapple with some of these concepts. It's not used to thinking, for example, about these as social experiences. And, and again, I don't have any specific familiarity with apparel, but most loyalty marketing programs are just one-on-one. -on -one. They're just your interaction. They're not about your interaction with your friends, which in games are incredibly powerful and incredibly motivating. So we're just starting to see um, startups, for example, there's a company called CrowdTwist, that what they do is gamify loyalty programs, uh, mostly for um, media companies and other companies. But there are a number of companies that are looking at that. And I think it's a, it's a fruitful area, definitely, for expansion. Yes? Are you finding sort of um, that there is a limitation uh, for a particular game? Um, or that, you know, can you hit uh, the funness aspect of it that you can keep something going for a long, long time? Mm -hmm. um, I understand this is fairly new. Um, any perspectives around how to motivate people once the initial rush? Yeah. So, sure, there are limits. And um, uh, games are not typically fun forever, although there are some games that are. I mean, you think about people's experience with games like golf or, or whatever it is where, where people talk, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, a few hours to learn and a lifetime to master. There certainly can be games that are like that. They have to have an enduring set of challenges. You have to feel like you constantly have more to do in the game. And most of these gamified systems, especially the, the what I call the PBL type ones, the ones that say earn points, the ones that look more like loyalty programs, earn points, you level up, you get rewards and so forth, they, they tend to hit a ceiling far before, far before that because they're, they're not about challenge, they're not about fun as much. Um, so again, the, the design process, what I've talked about, is about saying how far can we push this? 
how do we create that? What, what can we do that would make this engaging that's not just about this transaction, but that's about a challenge? Because it turns out, again, if you, if you actually even look at the, the psychological, the neurological studies about what as, parts of the brain get activated when people are in these game-like experiences, um, they're about learning, they're about challenges that actually feels fun to us. So um, yes, a big problem with a lot of the first generation gamification examples is it wears off. And, and that's partly what we're seeing, I think, with, with Zynga in the games world, is lots of people play Farmville, and they get these huge numbers, um, and everyone thinks it's going to go up and up forever, and it hasn't. Um, maybe that there is a limit for this kind of casual social game, which is interesting and engaging, but at the end of the day, there's no real deep challenge in Farmville. And so the question is, in the business system you're designing, can you find that? And there's no universal answer to that, but that should be the objective. I should go back uh, here in the middle, yes. I, I would be very interested in your thoughts on the way Facebook was able to log on extraordinary amount of growth in, in usership. Yeah. It, was there game elements to what they were doing to ramp such extraordinary mm -hmm. numbers in such a short time? You know, it's an interesting question. I haven't really thought about it. Uh, it certainly wasn't consciously gamified. So Zynga is a games platform that, that was built on top of Facebook, and, and they were very much thinking in conscious ways about getting people on, virality, and so forth. Um, social media is another area that's a cousin to gamification, because all these ideas about building viral systems and getting people engaged and social sharing and all that all relate to gamification, but they tend to think about them differently in the social media context. They don't tend to think of them as much as fun, um, but, but it's, it's very much related. So I don't have any direct knowledge about the Facebook team and the extent to which in the, the hyper growth phase of the company, they thought about it in this way. Um, but, but sure, almost anything that we look at online that has that takeoff effect, um, if you go back and analyze it, you can certainly see parallels to some of these ideas because it's, it's got to be something that people find fun and engaging and want to do and want to share with their friends. Um, so I think we probably could find some of those parallels. I just don't know to what extent the Facebook team consciously tried to do that. We've got time for a couple more. Yeah, over here. Two unrelated questions. First one, is there an evolutionary basis for our success at gaming or our requirement to game, like mm -hmm. hunting for food yeah. or... Have you looked at the biological? Yeah. So, so I haven't, but others have. And uh, there are a number of researchers who have postulated essentially what you described, that um, we are evolved to be hunter-gatherers in the savanna, because that's what we were for a whole lot more time than we've been um, you know, alumni at the Wharton School as a species. Um, and um, you think about these aspects I've talked about. The brain loves surprise. Um, it loves challenges, it loves learning. All of that is really important if you want to survive as a Neolithic hunter-gatherer. Um, you really want to know, well, that, that thing in the bushes looks different. That might be a saber-toothed tiger. Um, you want to, you want to and, and then once you figure that out, you want to learn from that. So, um, so yes, there, there are um, both philosophers, anthropologists, and, and other scientists who, who contend that there is an evolutionary basis. There must be some basis. Because again, this is not just something that came about starting with Pong. This is something that goes back throughout all human history. Um, and sure, so there, there must be some very deep bases of it. Are there fundamental types of games? Have you classified games? Um, there are a number of different typologies. And I don't want to get too far afield. But there's a whole field, academic field, of games studies, who people, people who study the sociology and anthropology and rhetoric and so forth of video games. Um, and there's a number of different classifications people use. There's not one universal one. And for, for these purposes, it doesn't much matter. Um, what I'm looking at are the horizontal aspects all the way across. All right, a couple more in the back there. Yes. Yeah. I work at Deloitte, and my job is to actually introduce gamification and other yep. social media technologies into our employees' productivity gains and other processes. Yep. And the first thing I hear is, oh my gosh, there's so many technologies and so many things that I can gamify. Yep. What's the, how do you deal with, maybe I'm a little bit premature, but gamification fatigue? You're not going to play Monopoly and Scrabble yeah. and, and chess in one night. Yeah. So how do you prioritize? Is there a framework, I'm hoping yeah. it's in your book, that lets us prioritize the different areas where you can implement gamification and experience more success than others? 
Yeah, so you guys are ahead of the curve, and, and Deloitte is, is we both, I know some of the work that, that's gone in internally, but Deloitte's also published some really, if you're interested in finding out more about this, after you buy my book, um, there's some great, uh, uh, Deloitte has published some great papers on, on applying gamification, especially in the enterprise. Um, it's another one, it's a really good question. Um, overall, we're too early. Um, so companies like yours that are at the leading edge are hitting this, and, and we're all going to hit it. Uh, that's another thing, again, drawing the analogy to social games, part of what's happened with Zynga is for a while this Farmville style of game was really new and cool, and people were like, whoa, wow, I can you know, come back and do these things, and my friends are doing it, um, and then suddenly it was, everyone was doing that. Every game worked that way, and everyone was getting bombarded, and, and there was that kind of collective fatigue. Um, absolutely, um, we're going to hit that in companies and especially across companies. Um, and um, then at that point, it becomes a design challenge for the designers and the intermediaries. So um, all of this depends on what population we're talking about. And so if you're in an organization, um, then you're in a position where you can structure it and control it more and integrate. So it's not just that we have six different point systems, but we can think about, all right, what, where do we want to make the points fungible across them? to do things inside and outside the organization and so forth. Um, in the world at large, we're not going to have that. The, the customer-facing marketing examples of gamification are gonna be developed by hundreds and hundreds of different companies. Um, then the challenge in the next evolution, and this is, we're not quite there yet, but as this matures, then the companies and organizations that are successful are the ones who are asking exactly the question you're asking. Um, let's assume everyone's gamified. What makes our example of gamification stand out? Um, and the approach that, that I've taken is um, not as much focused on prioritization, although certainly that, that would be helpful, especially in an internal context. Um, but again, going back to effective design, um, to really thinking about not just doing it for the sake of doing it, but you know, what is the core element of this gamified system? What's it trying to accomplish? Let's narrow it down and figure out how to target it more effectively. So then you don't have this situation where there's 10 different PBL type basically interchangeable systems, and the user just, uh, the customer just sort of throws up their hands and says, what's the difference? Um, they're all unique and have their own attributes. So that's about as much as I could say there, but yeah, it's a very good question that we're gonna come to. So, yes, right here. So the question was about the longevity of games and whether I've looked at the, the whether some games endure more than others. Um, not specifically, um, and, and partly it's, it's, it's a different kind of question. Um, and when we're thinking about something like chess, um, we don't see the 50,000 other games that came about 2,000 years ago or whenever chess was designed that have died out. We, we see the ones, it's an evolutionary process, the ones that have won and endured. Um, what I tend to do is, is more trying to reverse engineer. So what is it about things that endure that makes them endure? And we find things like a few very simple rules that have this combinatorial complexity. So you think about a game like chess, you know, it's so massively complex that it's only in recent years that we could build a supercomputer powerful enough to beat the world's best player. And yet, it's you know this little eight by eight board with a few pieces on it and a few rules. Um, so things like that are um, important aspects. And, and we can find attributes of games that way. But, but no, I haven't done a, a kind of longitudinal study. And, and again, it's a fascinating question for studying games, less important for studying gamification. Uh, we have time for one more question. All right. Okay. Who's got a really good question? <laughs> I'm I'm sticking I'm sticking around. All right. Well, you pick. You've got the microphone. Uh, I notice that people a lot younger than I tend to start playing online games without knowing the rules, mm -hmm. and that surprises me. Yeah. Um, is does that a characteristic of games yeah. also have an analogy? in gamification, yeah. I mean, yeah, so especially after you talked about, you know, knowing the rules and uh, mm -hmm. making the rules. Um, there's an expression that some of you may have heard in the computer industry called RTFM, which stands for read the freaking manual, um, because um, people increasingly, this is not just true of games, people have become accustomed to this promise that, oh, it's so easy, anyone can use it, um, and all the instructions are there, whether it's software or hardware, the company, here, here's the instructions. No one bothers to read them. They just say, oh, I should be able to figure out how to use this. And then people, you know, they call up the, uh, the IT department and say, well, how do I get this? And the person says, well, it's right there if you just read the instructions. Um, yes, there is an increasing tendency not to read the rules. 
Um, but what's happening uh, is also we're getting better at making the rules part of the game. So one of the things that these digital games have become very good at, at least the successful ones, um, is a process called onboarding and scaffolding, which is the beginning of the game is teaching you how to play the game without ever telling you that's what it's doing. So they ramp down the complexity and they give you certain information. They say, all right, look, click on this. Oh, look what happened, click on this, this happened. And then they add a little bit more and a little bit more and very subtly without realizing it, they're introducing all of the elements of the game without ever telling you. You go play any of the Zynga games, Cityville, Farmville, and so forth, your first part of the game is teaching you the rules. But they don't say, first go and read these rules over here and then go play the games. You never come back. They make it fun to actually learn the rules. So given that attention spans are compressing and given that people have been trained not to go and read the rules, um, and given that that tends to take away from this experience of fun, part of the design challenge is building systems that way that make learning about and understanding the game integral to the experience of playing the game itself. Um, you've been wonderful. I'm happy to stick around some more afterwards. Um, thanks so much for coming and for all of your great questions, and I hope you've taken something away from this. <laughs>